now it's time for the commemoration of uh, the innovations, the work, the life of a great scholar and a great man, the late Stephen Ross, who is the recipient of this year's Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize for Quantitative Financial Innovation. The prize, which is given every two years, recognizes outstanding quantitative research that has contributed to a particular innovation in the practice of finance. Uh, it's accompanied by an $80,000 cash award. This year, it is our honor to recognize Steve Ross for multi-factor asset pricing. From his 1976 paper, The Arbitrage Theory of Capital Asset Pricing, which appeared in the Journal of Economic Theory. Commonly known as the APT, the theory provides a framework for measuring the impact of various market, macro macroeconomic, uh, and security-oriented factors on an asset's return. When the paper was published, Steve was on the faculty of Penn, uh, Penn's economics department and held a secondary appointment uh, with the Wharton Finance Department. He went on to teach uh, at the Yale School of Management and the MIT Sloan School of Management. Steve was selected for this year's prize by a committee of esteemed academics and practitioners who are listed in the awards ceremony program. We were in touch with him shortly before he passed away, and I feel fortunate that we were able to let him know he was the winner. Though we are, uh, certainly wish Steve could be with us today, we are quite glad to have his colleagues and friends, David Musto and Richard Roll, here to speak about his life and his work. Before we hear from David and Dick, we will hear from Bruce Jacobs and Ken Levy, whose generous gift established the Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize in 2011. They will present the prize medal, uh, and we are so pleased to have Steve wa Steve's wife, Carol, here to accept it on his behalf. Now let me welcome Mike Gibbons, uh, who is Deputy Dean of the Wharton School and the I.W. Burnham, uh, uh, the second professor of investment banking. As Deputy Dean, uh, Mike oversees all aspects of the, schools, uh, of the school relating to faculty, curriculum, and research. He previously uh, served as chair of the finance department from 1994 to 2006. Before coming to Wharton in 1989, he was a tenured faculty member at the Stanford Business School. An outstanding teacher, Mike has been the recipient of Wharton's Excellence in Teaching Award. And he was co-author with Steve uh, Jay, uh, and Jay Shanking of the landmark paper, A Test of the Efficiency of a Given Portfolio, which they published in Econometrica in 1989, in which every student that I've taught at Wharton for the last 20 years has read as part of Topic 9. Uh, Mike? It is appropriate to honor Steve today, given that some of his work was actually extended into practice by Bruce Jacob and Ken Levy. Before I say a few words about Bruce and Ken, I'd like to thank them for the opportunity to be here to honor Steve. And as was mentioned, I co-authored a paper with Steve in 89. And I just have to say one thing about it. That joint research was a really special experience for me. And I got to see up close and personal, not only Steve's genius, but also his generosity of spirit. They say nothing succeeds like success, and certainly that can be applied to Jacobs Levy Equity Management, which has enjoyed 30 plus years of great success. However, for Bruce and Ken personally, I can append the adage, nothing succeeds like defying conventional wisdom, which describes their pioneering and innovative approach to sophisticated factor investing. Their use of econometrics and optimization theory is an elegant implementation of quantitative methods to deal with a dynamic and complex world. Anyone who has engaged in rigorous analysis understands that it takes a rare breed to wait patiently for things to come together. Bruce and Ken described their early years as a time when the only phone calls that interrupted their research was from their wives, not from their clients. But the hard work eventually led to, and here is a quote from them, a few courageous pension officers to help establish their firm footing in the business. Now we're many clients and employees later, and the groundbreaking strategies developed by Bruce and Ken are driven by their commitment to innovative equity research. The caliber of their quantitative financial research in award-winning articles spanning more than three decades 
is confirmed both by the success of their clients and company through a long history of changing financial markets, including chaos of the global financial crisis. Last but not least, their support of the Wharton School through the Jacobs Levy Equity Management Center for Quantitative Financial Research is their personal testament that the research endeavor and professional investment practice is a symbiotic relationship cultivating and enhancing the work of both investment professionals and academics. Thank you, Bruce and Ken. There are few people who, whose careers include both award-winning publications with simultaneous success and achievement in the business world. I'm honored to have Ken Levy speak first, and then Bruce Jacobs will follow. Thank you, uh, Chris and Mike, for those kind remarks. Steve Ross passed away too early, but his contributions to finance as a teacher, a practitioner, and an innovator live on, continuing to enrich the profession. Among the many gifts that Steve left us, arbitrage pricing theory stands out both in terms of its significant effects on the profession and as an exemplar of his insightful and rigorous way of thinking. Steve was barely out of graduate school when he first proposed arbitrage pricing theory in his 1976 article entitled The Arbitrage Theory of Capital Pricing. It would become part of the foundation of modern asset pricing and would inspire, among other things, the current popularity of factor investing. And by the time that paper was published, Steve had already produced another major work on agency theory, opening up a new field of economic research into the conflicting incentives of principals and their agents. He would go on, over a career that spans more than 100 publications, to author or co-author an astonishing 100 articles and a number of influential theories and models that are just integral components of today's financial world. These include the theories of risk-neutral pricing, the binomial option pricing model, models of the term structure of interest rates, and most recently, recovery theory, which allows us to forecast the probability distribution of security returns from option prices. The volume of his work is exceeded only by the value of his work. Given the practical importance of Steve's research and the widespread use of his models and theories, it's no surprise that he was in great demand as a consultant and advisor to financial service firms, corporations, and government agencies. Yet somehow, he also found the time to write books on corporate finance and neoclassical finance, to manage money for clients, and to inspire so many students as a professor at Wharton, Yale, and MIT. We're proud that arbitrage pricing theory began as a working paper at Wharton, where Steve was a professor of economics and finance. It's very fitting that we're recognizing this monumental contribution with the Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize, not only because of his past connection to the school, but also because his innovative work truly embodies the essence of what the prize represents, namely rigor, insight, and practicality. The Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize for Quantitative Financial Innovation recognizes outstanding quantitative research that has contributed to an important innovation in the practice of finance. When Ken and I established this biennial award in 2011, it was our hope that over time the recipients would constitute an elite group of scholars and practitioners who would have had a transformative impact on finance. The first two prize recipients, Harry Markowitz in 2013 and Bill Sharp in 2015, certainly fit that description. Today's honoree, Steve Ross, stands shoulder to shoulder with both of them. Steve's work on arbitrage pricing theory, which is being honored today, began in the 1970s when he was a young professor at Wharton. Back then, like many in the field, he struggled to reconcile the insights of the premier 
pricing model of the time, the capital asset pricing model, with some of its limitations, not the least of which was that it hinged on a single risk factor, namely beta. Steve's elegant solution was to create the first multi-factor model in finance. It recognized an asset sensitivity not only to market beta, but also to unanticipated changes in interest rates, inflation, and other economic variables. The capital asset pricing model implied that all investors should hold the same global market portfolio. On the other hand, arbitrage pricing theory implied that investors' optimal portfolios would vary depending upon their individual risk profiles and expectations. And most importantly, it did not require the strong assumption of human rationality that pricing models typically rely on. That opened up asset pricing theory to a world in which mispricing can occur and even be exploited before being arbitraged by market forces. Many asset pricing models have followed in the wake of APT, but APT still towers above them all. We are proud to award the Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize to Steve in recognition of his transformative accomplishments. When I spoke to Steve and informed him about winning the prize, he was delighted. While we are saddened that he is no longer with us, his work and his spirit live on. We are very pleased to be able to share our deep respect and admiration for Steve with his wife, Carol. Carol, would you do us the honor of accepting the prize medal? On behalf of Steve, I thank you so much for honoring him with the Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize. When Steve heard the news of this award, he was enormously thrilled, pleased, and humbled. And if he were standing here today instead of me, he would express his unbridled joy, his humility, and some disbelief to be receiving the award that was formerly bestowed upon Harry Markowitz and Bill Sharp, longtime mentors and friends. Wharton, as you've heard, was Steve's first academic home, and it was there that he interacted with so many luminaries. Uh, these names may mean nothing to you, but they meant a great deal to us. People such as Irwin Friend, Oliver Williamson, Bob Summers, Michael and Susan Wachter, Bill Ethier, Carl Schell, Bob Pollock, Ed Burmeister, and Albert Andow, just a few of those faculty from the early years at Wharton. And it was at Wharton that he began to think about arbitrage pricing, the basis for factor investing. As I stand here today, I feel as if we have circled back to our home. Throughout his life, Steve was a teacher, a writer, and a thinker. However, he was not an ivory tower academician. He was an individual who possessed a curiosity and unquenchable thirst for adventures, for puzzles, for unsolved mathematical problems. His brilliance was coupled with strong character and his vibrancy with generosity. He lived a life in which he harnessed the world of abstract knowledge to useful action, and he combined a wonderful trifecta, character, control, and momentum. And always he took the heart to heart the words of Richard Feynman that, that he heard so many years ago at Caltech, and I quote, it is our responsibility to do what we can to learn what we can, improve the solutions, and pass them on. Thank you for honoring him. 
Carol, thank you again for being here and for those beautiful words. Uh, everyone here owes Steve a great uh, debt uh, on multiple dimensions. Uh, we appreciate your presence. Uh, thank you also, uh, Bruce and Ken and Mike. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce uh, David Musto uh, as our next speaker, a long-term uh, colleague of mine. Uh, David is the Ronald Perlman Professor of Finance in the, in the, at the Wharton School and has served as the chairperson of the finance department since 2013. He's also a senior financial economist uh, and I guess now a consultant with the Securities and Exchange Commission. He's been recognized with awards including the 2015 Teaching and Curricular Innovation Award uh, for the Wharton MBA program. Before coming to Wharton, David worked as a programmer for Trout Trading Company and as a systems consultant for Roland Ross Asset Management, which was founded by Steve Ross and Dick Roll. Uh, David met Steve growing up in New Haven uh, while Steve was on the faculty at Yale. And from what I understand, uh, it was Steve who encouraged David to pursue economics rather than medicine uh, or other areas of academic pursuit as his father had hoped. Uh, David, uh, we thank you for being here today to speak about Steve's life and work. You have the floor. So Bruce and Ken asked me to come say a few words because, as Chris just indicated, I um, go way back uh, with Steve. And uh, in fact, how far back? Well, um, I was a babysitter. <laughs> Seriously, I, was, I, was, I knew Kate and John from a swim team where I was older than they were and they invited me to babysit their kids. It was the best babysitting gig imaginable, really. Kate and John were so charming and well-behaved, did what I asked, and uh, Carol was taking a cooking class and would leave leftovers from her cooking class. He said, do you want some? Yes, I, yes, I do want some. And uh, there was a VCR with James Bond movies, you know? So uh, I would have, uh, Steve kindly paid me for something I would have done for free, I think. So it was, uh, it was great. And how did that transition to finance? Well, uh, actually, let me say one more thing. I got to show you this. I got to show you. John, his son, asked me to read the same story every night. And it, it, it was several years of babysitting. Um, every time, it was the same thing. This is it, Richard Scarry here. And uh, Steve always, he would always bring this up in years later that I had done this, and uh, how that must have been torture. I said, no, I, I, I like that, 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 that part of the book about wood also, so I learned a lot. So that was, uh, that was, um, so that, that's when I was in high school, and then, but he had an Apple II, it was a Stephen early adopter of an Apple II, I, it was sitting there, and I would serve code on it while I, uh, when, after the kids went to bed, and Steve said, oh, that's interesting, you like to do that, uh, would you like to uh, be an RA uh, for me, since I was then entering college, I said, great, I'll do that, uh, I'd love to, I'd love to work for you, so I reported to his office, this would be June of 83 now, I reported to his office at, on the Yale campus. And the Yale Business School at that time uh, occupied several uh, very nice mansions on a quiet, wide street in, um, in, in, in New Haven. And he was at that far uh, right-hand corner there on the second floor, this big office looking out over this quiet scene. And Bruce and Ken wanted me to give a sense of what it was like you know, what, what Steve was like, what it was like interacting with him. And I gotta say, from my point of view, the special thing, what I, what I saw wasn't just a very smart guy doing very good work. Uh, Steve, what I, the way I look at it, he, he used his special gift um, to simplify his life, to do just what he wanted to do. Now, he did a lot, but uh, he, he, his life was in some ways always very serene, and being in his office was always a very serene experience, though the, the intellectual intensity was very high, and I always had to think for days after I talked to him about what exactly did that mean, what the, what the depth of, of, of our discussion was always very, uh, as, as Mike was saying a moment ago, is a genius that that's just always, was always there. And he would give me uh, odd tasks that sort of just things he was interested in uh, for me to work on. It could be coding, uh, it could be uh, uh, proofreading, uh, it could be uh, data entry, all sorts of things. One task that sticks in my mind because I uh, failed at it involved Irving Fisher, who also had been at Yale and had left all his papers to Yale. And Steve, at one point, in looking at Irving Fisher's papers, had seen um, some document where Irving had written something on the other side of like a bond uh, indenture or something like that. And Steve wanted me to go find it. 
and because he couldn't quite remember what he wrote, but he wanted to, he wanted to quote it somewhere. And so I went to the Yale Library, and the Irving Fisher archive was, was dozens of banker's boxes full of documents. And I sat there for days looking through, and I learned things like Irving Fisher was a dedicated Fletcherite, which means he would chew each bite 28 times. Uh, you could read every word of the lecture that he gave at Yale, but he, I could never find that document. Uh, but that was just an example of Steve, just a wide-ranging intellect, noticing everything, and um, you never knew where his inspiration was going to come from. You know, you look at Steve, of course, a very successful man uh, who did, did very well, um, and you might, you might look at that and say, well, for someone who, who, who just loved doing economics, he sure... Uh, you know, did very well um, doing it. And I, I, it brings to mind a quote that I've heard attributed to Michael Caine, though the internet also attributes to other people, but I love the quote. It makes me think of Steve, where someone says to Michael Caine, boy, you sure are paid a lot uh, to act. You're paid a lot, aren't you? And he says, well, you know what? I'm paid to wait. The acting is free. Right? And that's sort of how I felt about Steve, that, that, that he, all the gifts we got, we got for free. Uh, he, was, that, he, he, he loved to do that. Of course, he also, uh, you know, as a consultant and so on, uh, did very well. But, uh, you know, the acting was free. So I went to work for Steve, as Chris indicated, at Roland Ross Asset Management. It's interesting, an interesting parallel between Roland Ross and uh, Jacobs Levy. Uh, both went live in 86, and that was sort of the time to go live as a, as a long equity manager um, because pension funds were just moving heavily uh, into equities. And so, um, you know, just like Bruce and Ken, uh, Dick and Steve were entrepreneurs uh, jumping on this. And, of course, this was uh, keyed off of the arbitrage pricing theory. We don't need to sort of recite it again. I think the main thing to... The main thing I, you know, I want to notice about all the work Steve did is just how elegant and robust it was. And if Steve, once Steve did it, it was done, right? Some, of, some people here were at the event we had for Sandy Grossman's retirement from Morton. And at that point, um, there was um, a, lot of, a lot of papers on the question of um, convex payoffs being fed through concave utility. Uh, you know, convex payoffs encourage risk. Concave utility discourages risk. And so what happens when one goes through the other? And there was papers sort of groping around about this question, and Steve just solved the whole thing. Yeah, that was his paper that he presented at Sandy's retirement. He just, he just, it's all he thought about it for a bit, and he solved the whole thing. And that was just his, his nature, robust and, and elegant, and just like the APT was. Um, and so, uh, so I went to work for Roland Ross Asset Management where the uh, theory went into practice. So the arbitrage pricing theory became the arbitrage pricing technique. And um, it was, yeah, I'm not gonna try to characterize all that went on there. Needless to say, it's, it was a subtle, um, subtle but important advantage that, that Roland Ross had, which is to uh, understand the relationship between risk um, and expected return through a multi-factor framework when the rest of the world was still thinking of it uh, through a single-factor framework. Uh, so it was an interesting intellectual uh, question to resolve, you know, what is, the, what is the special sauce, how do we apply it, and so on. I'm not going to say I was part of that conversation, but I was, a, I was a fly on the wall of the best wall to be a fly on. And, um, so, uh, and then I went out there, it's interesting, you know, at Steve's office um, in New Haven, he and his secretary, Mary Pulverari, um, had this running joke that there is no such person as Dick Roll. Right, you know that. Uh, yeah, yeah. You go have a good time with Dick Roll, right? You know, Dick Roll uh, just called, right? It was like, you no, know, right. Uh, and so then I get to LA, and like, there really is a Dick Roll, and uh, uh, who'd been an aeronautical engineer. And Dick can tell you later that uh, he was on the design team for the 727, which uh, I've learned since was like the fastest commercial airliner. We're all creeping along at 0.8 Mach, whereas that was 0.9 Mach. So why why haven't we gotten there yet in our plane flight? We're like creeping along. It's because Dick turned to finance instead. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, we uh, the, the managed money the, and and the the Chenrol Ross factors were key to the marketing of the product, to um, to the pension funds, 
so, and I would have to go to the UCL library and, and, and actually just, you know, get that, get that data um, as it came out, though mostly we were using mimicking portfolios, just as we saw earlier in the day. Dick can talk about that later if he wants. And you can see how this is just a graphic. They're trying to, you know, describe to clients who barely understand what a return is sometimes, uh, what the special uh, uh, ability is that you have because you understand a multi-factor model when everyone's thinking a single factor, and this is just from the, from the deck that was used back in those days to try to explain that. Anyhow, so that was uh, uh, Roland Ross. It was, it, was, it was a terrific opportunity to see them put uh, theory to practice and just see Steve in another light. I remember one time Steve uh, showing up and he, he says, he, he shows up at his, at his Beverly Hills Hotel and he comes to the office and says that uh, clearly the, the people at the hotel thought he was the Stephen Ross who ran Warner Brothers, right? Because he shows up and there's this gigantic, you know, uh, floral display and all sorts of things you might provide to a uh, studio boss rather than a finance professor. Um, so that was, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was, it was a great days. Um, and then, uh, in the, actually right in the middle of, uh, three months into my job, uh, the market crash happened. And that was also very interesting to be in that such an academic environment. Um, when the market crashed, they were all saying, well, that's interesting, right? You know, and sort of started studying it. We actually had a very good crash. We didn't crash as much as the rest of the market. Um, and uh, Dick immediately set to writing a paper about it. And, um, and we got a fax from Bob Schiller like the next day, sort of like asking, you know, what are your feelings or something like that. And so it was a very academic environment in which to be experiencing the crash. So I was at the company for uh, two years, and that was, uh, it was it, we uh, saw Steve frequently. It was a terrific uh, experience. And then since then, you know, uh, I, of course I saw Steve now and then as often as, as, as I could, but mostly I've experienced Steve the way the rest of us have, just through his work. I look at, I look at the you know, this binomial tree and think, you know, this is, Steve's work is so pervasive, people don't even think about it, right? You know, people working in finance are like fish who don't know what it means to be wet, right? I mean, it's just, it's just Steve, Steve's work is just all, all around us, and you wonder, are people, you know, thankful uh, for the, what, what he did for the field? It's like being thankful for the alphabet, right? Um, and it reminds me that in, um, in Korea, people are actually thankful for their alphabet, right? They know who invented it. It was Sejong the Great back in 1443, and they have a day in his honor. They remember that, that who created their alphabet. And you wonder, 600 years from now, let's hope that uh, finance is as vital as it is today, and people remember uh, who gave them their, their alphabet. So uh, just to uh, wrap it up, I, um, I was back at Yale, um, a couple weeks ago, and I walked past that old office where I used to go and see Steve and where he worked for 20 years in that office. And I thought, well, what's, what's happening there now? Who's there now? Does that person have a sense of the history of that office? And you know, what, so just, just trying to try recapture some of that moment of, of seeing Steve. I, and I go up there, and I actually go into the building. I walk up the old stairs, past where Mary used to sit, and I find, there it is, that was Steve's office. And now it was three astrophysics postdocs who must be fugitives because they did not want to be in the picture. Um, but uh, that, was, uh, that, that was Steve's office, um, and it did bring back a lot of memories. And it made me, but I, I was trying to recapture that moment of seeing Steve, and it just reminded me, just looking at it, of the, uh, of the quote. I mean, people know when, uh, when Leonard Nimoy passed away two years ago, I thought that was a beautiful moment. When he passed away, he had his last tweet he sent out, which said that a life is like a garden where perfect moments can be had, uh, but not preserved except in memory. And I thought that's sort of how I think of Steve. We, had, we all had a perfect moment with Steve, and uh, we can preserve that in our memory. So that's all I'm going to say and hand it off to Dick. Thank you, David, very much. Uh, now for a few words from Steve's collaborator, friend, and business partner, Dick Roll. Uh, Dr. Richard Roll is the Lind Institute Professor of Finance at Caltech. He also holds an emeritus appointment as the Joel Fried Chair in Applied Finance at UCLA Anderson. He joined the faculty there more than 40 years ago and was previously on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon, the European Institute, and HEC. 
He founded and directed the Mortgage Securities Research Group at Goldman Sachs and led Roland Ross Asset Management along with Steve Ross uh, for 20 years. Dick has published more than 100 articles uh, in peer-reviewed journals and is a four-time winner of the Graham and Dodd Award for financial writing. If I could conti continue to describe just the highlights of uh, Dick's distinguished career uh, uh, in business and academia and also his influence on all of us, uh, we'd be here until the sun comes up. Uh, I'll just mention one more thing. Uh, he worked on the Minuteman missile and the Saturn moon rocket. <laughs> so, <laughs> Were there are a lot of stories to, to hear as well. Uh, without further ado, please welcome Dick Roll. Thank you. Thanks, Dick. Well, thanks. I, I'm sorry you talked about the Saturn moon rocket because that tells you how old I am. Uh, that was 1960, I think, or 61. So I'd like to just uh, share a few memories of Steve. And as I show on this uh, slide here, he had almost everything in life except length. He was a son, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a scholar, an entrepreneur, and a friend. And I'll say a few words about uh, each one of those. I go back a long time with Steve, too. Maybe not quite this long. Here's a picture of Steve telling a joke to his parents, uh, circa 1946. And a little bit later, he was trying to get his bar mitzvah, but his Hebrew was really terrible. It gave him a lifelong aversion to learning languages and being religious. So a little bit later, uh, here he is at Caltech, um, st studying with Richard Feynman, name you all know, in physics. He got a BS at Caltech in 1965 with honors, and then he shifted uh, to economics. One of the reasons was he was in Feynman's class at Caltech, and he a student next to him in the front row, he turned to him and said, hi, I'm Steve Ross, and I was first in Massachusetts on the uh, math exam. And the kid next to him says, well, I was first in the Midwest on the math exam. They turned and looked the other way, and the kid said, well, I was first in the United States. <laughs> so he thought he might be at a comparative disadvantage to stay in physics. If, uh, no, that's really not true, but... Uh, so there he is again in 2015, a more recent uh, picture. And his scholarly achievements, um, Ken mentioned a few of these before, agency theory, the arbitrage pricing theory, the binomial model, risk neutral pricing, interest rate dynamics, which is a continuous time term structure model, and even more recently, the recovery theorem, which allows people to recover objective probabilities from option pricing uh, implied uh, risk-neutral probabilities. He had two books, which are one of which is a bestseller. It's, it's corporate finance in its 11th or I guess maybe 12th edition now. I actually use it in the undergraduate class at Caltech. Uh, it's not supposed to be for undergrads, but you know Caltech undergrads are uh, a little bit different. So. His scholarly honors, he was president of the American Finance Association, Financial Engineer of the Year, he won a bunch of prizes before the Jacobs Levy Prize, uh, Smith Breeden, Graham and Dodd, Pomerantz, Melamed, Deutsche Bank Prize. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he even has a prize, the Steve Ross Prize, which is awarded to other people, which uh, is a prize that's uh, been set up by his students, mainly his doctoral students, who, uh, of which there are many, and they, um, they founded this Foundation for the Advancement of Research in Financial and Economics, and they give the Steve Ross Prize to somebody, some worthy person every year. But he wasn't just a scholar. His family was supremely important to him. He loved athletics. Um, I'll say a few words about military service and about religion and art and so on. And of course, he was an entrepreneur, and he also was a big fan of food and wine. So in terms of family, in addition to be a son and a brother, he was a father, a grandfather, an uncle-in-law, a son-in-law. Carol, his wife is here, Kate and John, his children, Lucy and Polly Bosch, his grandchildren, Anthony, who was uh, his, his Carol's sister's son, who was, he was very fond of Anthony. And Anthony actually worked at Roland Ross also, in addition to David, for a while. And Carol's mother, his mother-in-law, 
Um, he was always proud of the fact that whenever he told anybody about a, a, a he talked about a Ponzi scheme, he said, you know, my mother-in-law actually knew Ponzi. Ponzi <laughs> lived in her block in, in Boston. So here's a picture taken by Steve. 1977, Carol, John, she's holding John and Kate there. This is Vancouver when we were there that, that year. Can you believe 40 years ago? Uh, we had a wonderful uh, summer there together. Actually, my wife and I are in the picture as well, but I've cropped us out. You wouldn't believe what we look like. <laughs> <laughs> Athletics. He loved basketball. But, of course, he's a bit challenged by his stature and his eyesight. Uh, uh, but he never missed a UConn game on TV. He loved American football. He was a big New England Patriots fan. He played golf, but you know he could have used more practice at that, I would say. But uh, he he did skiing. Uh, we went one time to St. Moritz, um, kind of an abbreviated career. But uh, but his most fond thing was sports car driving. He loved his Porsches, and of course, since he didn't see well out of one eye, you know, when he got in the car and you were a passenger, it was became a memorable experience for you, you know. Quite a few people have commented on this over the years, and Carol, I think, uh, may have been one of the first dates that, <laughs> that she had with Steve. She had the same experience uh, in Boston. Well, other activities. Well, military service, nah, he wasn't in favor of that. And after coaching was required as bar mitzvah, there wasn't much additional interest in uh, either Hebrew or, or coaching. But he was very fond of art, and he was a world-class collector of Indian pipe bags uh, and of Chinese paintings. Uh, Indian pipe bags are a, it's kind of a very unusual kind of collection, right? You, how many people do you know have collected Indian pipe bags? But Steve had a world-class collection of Indian pipe bags. I actually went to see a couple of exhibits of his pipe bags in New Mexico, uh, and they were, they were very, very impressive. His Chinese paintings as well, I guess, are uh, you know, one, of the, one of the great things that he did in terms of the art part. Entrepreneurship, uh, we've already talked a bit about Roland Ross Asset Management. He started some other companies too, more recently. Compensation Valuation, which is a company that's dedicated to valuing employee stock option grants using the binomial model, something that he invented. Ross, Jeffrey, and Antle use option trading and they use things re related to the recovery theorem in that, uh, in that uh, firm. He was a director of Jin Ri, of CREF, of Freddie Mac, and he was a trustee at Caltech, where, of course, he was also an alum, and he did a lot of legal consulting, as, as people know. He was able to charge very impressive uh, consulting fees, uh, I thought. <laughs> food and wine. Well, food, he liked it. Uh, we had some notable dining experiences. One that Carol probably remembers is at Ilhoisen in eastern France where they served Carol a piece of foie gras about the size of a softball with a black truffle in the middle. Do you remember that, Carol, the thing? And my wife wouldn't order it because it cost $90. But she liked it so much that the next day I had to take her back for lunch so she could order the thing. Uh, he loved lobsters and things like that. He liked wine, and there was one um, thing about wine. He's, he was a consummate market economist, so he had a firm belief that the more expensive the wine, the better the quality. Right? <laughs> so you see where that leads, right? It led to a rule that he and I had all through the, the time we knew each other, which is the following. When we went out to dinner, if he ordered the wine, he paid for it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was uh, one of the things that, you know, we, we enjoyed very much. I would say, though, you know, talking about a friend, uh, I want to tell you two things come to mind when I think about Steve. One is optimism, and one is a supreme sense of humor. As you can see from all we've talked about today, he had a fantastic sense of humor. And the two are sometimes combined. I will, I will you know... I never saw anybody with so much optimism 
One of my oldest memories was that he and I were working on an empirical paper and we got some what I thought were disappointing empirical results and I was dejected. But he looked at the stuff we'd been printing out of the computer and he said, you know, with all this horse manure in here, there's bound to be a pony someplace. Right? <laughs> so I always thought of that as, as really a you know, an indication of both his uh, sense of humor and his optimism. More serious, though, throughout life, uh, one is fortunate to have only a couple of really close friends with whom you can share any thought, enjoy their company, be separated and come back together again and start up exactly where you left off. And such a friend overlooks your faults and, and uh, affirms your virtues. He was that friend for me, and he can never be replaced. Uh, I'm going to start it off. Uh, it's always fascinating to me to hear how uh, other researchers approach the task of research. Uh, can you comment on, uh, on Steve's approach and how it uh, related to yours? Uh, was it the same? Was it different? Do you like to work early in the morning, late at night? Both? Uh, well, I think all, all day long. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always had, the, I always had this, um, since I'm mainly an empirical guy and he's a consummate theorist, I was, tell, I was always joking with him that, you know, it takes us to discover an anomaly before you theorists have to figure out how to explain it, right? So we were always talking like that. But, uh, but we were so uh, well together because, uh, first of all, he was, he was so smart, he could solve any problem. In fact, just this, this in the recent past, just, a, just a early this year, like in January, I, I asked him to solve a problem I was working on in a paper, and I couldn't figure it out, and he just, he did it like that. So, you know, he was fantastic in terms of math ability and insight into uh, solving, solving problems. Uh, so, you know, I, I really uh, valued and enjoyed working with him uh, very much. Um, in fact, you know, going back to the things we're talking about at the conference today, the APT, which was, the paper was published in 76, but he actually had been working on this a couple of years prior to that. And um, when we got together um, right after the paper was published, we, we worked on the first empirical test of the APT, which was published in 1980 uh, in the uh, Journal of Finance. And um, our objective in that paper was not to identify the factors, but just try to figure out how many pervasive factors are there in US equity returns. And, and the conclusion was, you go back and look at the paper, it was four, it's, at least four and probably five factors. That was 1980. So three years ago, would you believe it, Fahm and French published their five-factor model. <laughs> Did they cite our paper? <laughs> no. But, and Steve is not too happy about that. I oh, he wasn't. <laughs> Dick, thank you so thank much. You. David, thank you so much. Uh, for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you.